the original word coach comes from universities in the 1800s where you'd take a, a student from one place to another place to develop them and prepare them for their exams. So you're like the coach taking a passenger. And I think that that's a really good fundamental to be thinking about it because you've got coaches and you've got instructors and you've got trainers. But with coaching, you've got a learning component to it. Welcome to the Your Data Driven Podcast. If you like this podcast, be sure to visit our website at yourdatadriven.com for more useful help and advice on setting up your race car, mastering data analysis, and driving faster. Welcome to episode 32. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Thompson to the show. Paul is a veteran of nine Olympic Games as a senior Iron coach. His crews have won medals in the last seven games, where he's represented Australia, Great Britain and China. There are a remarkable number of similarities between rowing and motorsports. Paul shares with you his perspectives on the role of coaching and what you should look for in a coach. You'll learn how Paul sets up a medal-winning training environment and how you can take some of those insights to develop yourself as a driver. He even shares a novel but highly effective way to rapidly reduce some weight. It's a fascinating show from one of the global legends in Olympic rowing. So let's hear what Paul has to say. Welcome, Paul. Hello, and how are you? Great. It's a real honour to have you on the show. I can't wait to hear actually how you're going to uh, compare your sport of rowing to our sport in motorsport. What we're going to try and do is work through those similarities and see if we can get to a point where there's maybe one or two takeaways for people listening that they can go away and they can think about, hey, how can I put this stuff into action that's going to help me in my racing or my track day experience or my sim racing or whatever people are doing who are listening? It's not an obvious comparison. And I'm sure during this conversation, people will come out the other end and go, actually, yeah, it's very similar to motorsport. But let's start off. So for people who don't know, who are you? What have you done? And let's hear a bit more about you and your background. Okay. Thanks for that very kind introduction, Samir. And yeah, I think it's a really interesting area. And the longer I've been in sport, the better the connections are across sport is that there's more similarities than than differences. And and I was really fortunate to go all the way back as I was an athlete myself, Australian athlete, and was uh, at the Australian Institute of Sport and um, with the national squad and had a bike accident actually got knocked off my bike and the coach at the time got me into coaching very young at 24 actually and we started a pilot program of getting people into the sport that hadn't been involved in the sport where were you based at that time yeah at the AIS in Australia and took someone up to be world Olympic champion and the, the irony is that's what's developed with British rowing now so through the start program and so I've benefited from uh, from the same process years later. Obviously, I've been coach of World Olympic Champions, been to eight Olympics as a coach, three for Australia, four for the UK, and one for China. It was at Tokyo in China. And yeah, I've been really fortunate to have coached medal-winning boats at the last seven games and been through a variety of firsts. And it's just been a fabulous journey. And that's where we got to connect up doing some really interesting stuff in, in our sport, this, with UK sport. And it's helped me to look at what I do in a completely different way. Yeah, absolutely. So just so people listening yeah. have some idea. So I, I've done some work with Paul and looking at the sport of rowing and how you are preparing athletes to perform under pressure. So my contribution has always been on the data side and maybe some of the process and the engineering mindset that goes into making the boat go quicker but your contribution is very much on the coaching side and that's something I think in motorsport is still quite underrepresented so how would you define coaching that's a really good question yeah the, the original word coach comes from universities in the 1800s where you'd take a, a student from one place to another place to develop them and prepare them for their exams so you're like the coach taking a passenger. And I think that that's a really good fundamental to be thinking about it because you've got coaches and you've got instructors and you've got trainers. But with coaching, you've got a learning component to it. You know, I've always had the philosophy that the more the athlete understands what they're doing and what they're about, then the better they're going to execute it and the better they're going to perform under pressure. So that's how I see coaching, mentoring, 
and being able to develop the potential out of someone, whether that's in motor racing or, or rowing or track and field or table tennis. I think there's a real role for there. As, a, as an athlete, I had a period without a coach. So I've done it both ways, so to speak. And definitely, if you've got a good coach and you can connect well with them and got a good relationship, then it's very rich and rewarding. What is a good coach? Because I think this is a, a real question, particularly in our sport and, and maybe in yours as well, in the sense of what, how do you know what you're looking for? If you've never had coaching before, what can you expect? Yeah. Yeah, and look, if you look at the tennis players, they employ their coaches. And if you look like what we do, a federation employs the coach and the athlete gets given the coach. So there's different ways. And in in motor racing, I presume you get to choose who you want to work with rather than the other way around. And that's where, for me, a coach needs to know what that performance is going to look like. What is the ultimate performance? So in, in our game, We know that the boats go faster every four years, so we have to be predicting how fast that boat's going to be and how we're going to prepare it to get there. You might have a coach that's stronger on the technical side, or you might have a coach that's very good at man management, or you might have a coach that's good in in physiology or or engineering or whatever science it is, and you'll have to to look and see how it connects. And sometimes the coach at, at one level is good, but you need another coach to take you to the next level. What makes a great coach? can vary in the situation and vary with the, with the people. But you need to be able to be a good communicator, know your knowledge. You've got to be able to build a good relationship and be able to get people to get the best out of themselves. Sometimes that comes with a carrot. Sometimes that comes with a stick. Okay, that's quite interesting. And I'm just guessing here from what I've seen. But I think people haven't really got much to go on. So they look at that person's ability to, in our case, drive a car fast. And one of the things that is interesting for me especially having worked with all these olympic teams and yourselves is that i don't think it's necessarily that relevant that you can drive faster than me and therefore if i can drive faster than you that means that i can be your coach and i don't think that's a very good metric it's it's a metric i think you need to be able to drive fast i think you need to be able to empathize with what the driver is doing but at the same time i don't think the best coaches are necessarily the best performers Uh, I think they can get the best from the performer. What do you think? That's an interesting point. And some top athletes make top coaches, but very few. And the attributes that you need to be a a top athlete are uh, sometimes very different to what you need to be be a coach. Because as a coach, it's not about you. It's about the other person. Whereas if you're the if you're the athlete, it's 110% about you and what you can do. And quite often, what you do is unique to you. That works for you, but it doesn't necessarily work doesn't necessarily work for other people so quite often the people that haven't quite made it made it there have had to nut out things in a different way to be able to to connect people and make those performances performances happen having said that you need to develop your credibility because that's an important aspect of coaching and quite often that can come from your own performance as an athlete or in the coaching in the coaching field as well so that that's something there but yeah not always there's a couple of difference there on the skills i think on the personality side do you think that's important because you mentioned carrot and stick there and i think that's a really interesting point particularly in our sport where the consequences of getting it wrong are well yeah potentially quite bad (laughs) have you said this in a rowing boat if you get it wrong that all can come around you can get hurt quite a lot if you get it wrong but It's just having that balance, isn't it? How do you manage that bit? So at some point, someone does need a bit more encouragement, but like, how do they unlock it in themselves? Yeah, look, we're moving into into psychology now, and you're right, the consequences of, of, and we saw this at the Tokyo Olympics. uh, We had really quite big waves, a Norwegian boat tipped over, other boats lost medals, and quite often you could see it. If you look out of the boat, that was when the moment happened because you're not concentrating on what you're doing. So staying in the moment is a real skill that top top achievers are able to do. And quite often they don't know whether they've won or they lost when they cross the line. Really? Uh, because they're focused in on their own in our sport. It's, it's making sure your boat goes from A to B as fast as it can. So you'll have a, I'll talk about it's a bit like with uh, martial arts. You've got your hard eyes that are directly in what you're doing and then you've got soft eyes on what your competitors are because you can't slow them down. You can only make you go faster. So how you focus there is and stay in the moment is pretty critical in those points. But you need to be able to be in the right mindset. Um, We did a lot of work before 2012 about controlling your heart rate variability through your breathing. So there was breathing techniques that you can therefore control your emotions. 
and how you react to different situations before you get in there. To pick up on that, is that a thing? So is that for nerves or for yeah, physiology because, or something? Yeah, you've got an arousal curve and your arousal curves go, you're under aroused, you're just at that right level, you're over aroused and you've got to hit that sweet spot. So some people get tight or nervous or if you're doing a, a piano recital yeah. and you're able to do it on your own and then you go out in, in front of a group of people and you get stage fright, and you don't know what you're going to do. That's part of the fight and flight response. So what happens there is you're in a threatening situation. So you you shut down the conscious thinking and you just go to the reactive. Am I going to fight or am I going to flight? Or you sit there. So because all of us in motor racing and in rowing, you, you're putting yourself in that position. So if you can control your physiology, not to go into the fight and flight response, but be able to control it. You might want to feel aggressive or you might want to feel calm. And we might be racing together and you might want to feel aggressive and I might want to feel calm or however you can describe those feelings typically before you race and when you race. And some races you'll go well and some races you won't. You can, if you're reflective enough, which is a, a really big tool for a successful athlete and coach, then you can get yourself into the right state to be performing at your best. Okay, and what's that technique then? If you Google it, there's a group that do it complete coherence. So I don't know whether that's too much of an ad or not. But uh, if you can look <laughs> and there's apps, there's breathing apps that you can do. So there's different ways you can find out about it. But it, it's really about how, how you can control yourself to, to do that. That's quite an interesting thing. So what, one of the things that I would be thinking about is how I would prepare for that. So how can I practice that? So but how do you practice for these big well, races? Yeah, so your training environment is absolutely critical because how you train will be how you race. If you can practice those situations and scenarios in training, so whether I'm not sure in motorsport whether you do that unopposed or opposed or however you, you structure your, your, your training so that when you get to the racing, you're aware of what you need to do and when you need to do it. Like in, in our game, and I keep saying, it's in the quality of strokes. That The more gold medal quality strokes they're doing, then, well, then the more they're going to be challenging for a gold medal. So if their stroke length is too short or if they're not working at that level, then it's not going to come into the racing. You know, like you can't have your foundations on sand and then just hope for the best. That quality of your training sessions and what those training sessions involve sets you up for what you're going to do on race day. Okay, so that's the technique side of things. And we definitely have that in in driving a car. There is There are techniques and there are skills that you can develop and there's uh, smoothness and f feel and, and awareness of what's going on. There's certainly these things. And, and interestingly, it's quite a simple motor racing as well. It, like you can, you've got some pedals and a steering wheel. <laughs> it's, it, from, compared to I don't know, martial art or something you mentioned earlier, it's quite a lot less that you have to do or think about. But there's that mental side as well. So how can you create an environment that gives you that same nervous tension so that then we're yeah. going to be practicing our breathing? Yeah. When I run the training program for the rowers, Mm. We'll have once or twice a week competitive sessions. So they'll have a pre-race routine. Uh, and so it's not just turning up on the day. That There'll be a routine that they get into to get into the right place, to get into that mindset, mm. and then be able to go out on the water and, and do their racing pieces in training so that you make mistakes in training that then you can get it right and right in racing. And something that uh, Steve Redgrove taught me was you need to be on a bad day good enough to win a, to win a medal. And actually, in your training, you need to be able to do that full training, but you don't need to give all that away in racing because all you need to do is finish in front of the other people so that you've always got something up your sleeve. But in training, you need to be able to deliver the whole thing so you know what to do if, if the scenario arises. But if you don't need to win more than you need to win, then then you can hold back a bit. Once you start getting to the getting to that level, you're really in business. So the way I see it, when I look at a group, you've got to learn how to train, then you've got to learn how to compete, and then you've got to learn how to win. And that's important. Or using, obviously, your racing season, it depends whether you've got a series of races or you build up to a championship to be able to use different competitions to be able to practice different things. And, and also, you, know, you don't have to win everything, but you need to be able to learn a lot. So it depends on what mindset that you take in there. Do you find people get disappointed? I think when I see people racing, and even if they're not even competing, if they're, they're just doing a track day or they're having fun with their friends or something, there's, there's always some element of competition in there, I think, because you, yeah. know, you want to be better than someone else. But then there can only be one winner. And 
it's the case of how do you manage that if you're not the winner so we race with 30 cars or something and there's only going to be one winner and there's going to be 29 uh, people who didn't win so you're saying basically you've got to learn from everything you do of course and there's a lot of talk in the press at the moment like how do you find winning of course there's only one winner and yeah everybody would like to come first and people are disappointed it's also how you set that in your mind because progress is is winning as well so you might be 30th in the first one and then you're stepping up it's how you set your how you set your goals and again how you reflect on what your performance is at the end of the day if you've got your car tuned as well as you can and you race like a demon and give your best performance you possibly can and you come sixth and that is your best performance so you've you've reached your potential that may be your ceiling and then you've got to come away and say, okay, maybe I need to do this and that, so that you need to be able to just build that performance step by step. You should be disappointed, but you shouldn't be upset. Oh, yeah? okay, I like yeah? that. Because clearly it's a competitive field and you want to test yourself and see where you get to. So, of course, you should be disappointed, but you don't need to be upset with yourself. And that's reassessing of goals and so that you've got a reviewing process, a reflective process, to be able to go to the next stage. Have you got any tips on reflective process after that? So what kind of things do you do in rowing? Well, like a journal is really good. So not just I've tuned the car to this or the technical side of things. I think that is what most people record is more yeah. technical stuff, perhaps. Or so there's another element to this, which is a concept I'm becoming more aware of. There's sort of a core ability to drive. And then there's your ability to apply that to a specific track. So you've got like how to navigate the track, but you've also got your core development as a racing driver or a driver. And there's, they're two kind of separate things. Because if you take it to the extreme, when you start out, it doesn't really matter what track you're on because you, you're just trying to develop your core skills. But then as you improve and get more experience, it then becomes increasingly about how can you optimize getting the most from the track side of things, because you've got all the skills. It's just how can you apply them? And so there's that kind of piece in there. And but we, so we end up focusing a lot on the technical and it's quite complicated. Cars yeah. are complicated. So that yeah. naturally people spend a bit more time over there. And we haven't, I don't think, do enough reflective stuff on ourselves or our, on that core side on that mm -hmm. core driving ability. So is that something yeah. you, you're saying with a journal? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also part of that journal, I encourage them to put a bit at the end about how you build your confidence because how do you build your confidence? And that's key in anybody's performance is record down that so that when you've absolutely nailed it and you've overtaken three people and we through and got the checkered flag, you can put down what you did, what you were thinking and how that was working. And then the next time you do something else. So you can record those bits there because then when you start losing a few races, you can go back and actually you've got a bit of a confidence bank there on things that you have done very well because confidence ebbs and flows, doesn't it? So I think, you know, you can use your journal for many things and also recording the, the, the progress. So you've got to be able to basically, well, we do this with the rowers, you've got an individual development plan. So you'll have the car development plan and then you'll have the driver development plan as well. And I see this. I'm fascinated with driving. I'll give the game away here because <laughs> motor racing, and when we were down at McLaren, I asked the same question. Um, we'll spend hours and squillions of pounds to get the car right, but then the driver will be dehydrated and then be trying to adapt to dehydration, which you can't do physiologically. We'll spend a lot of money to get the weight down in the car but then like with weight restricted sports, you can have a high fiber diet and then you can empty your stomach and you can lose 500, 750 grams out of your stomach. But that, that's not so sexy, <laughs> clearly. Um, so, so, the people listening are going like, has he just said yeah. that? Has he actually just said that? It's like, it's, it, there's a nutritional element here. I mean, a lot of people, when they're nervous, they, they, that happens naturally. But you're saying maybe yeah, you can correct. encourage a little bit more, a few, a few more yeah. half kilos yeah. come out. With a, yeah, with a bit of brown, yeah. brown flakes or something. <laughs> yeah, and how do you stay hydrated? So how do you look yeah. after yourself? And how do you get yourself in the right shape? Because there's so much focus on the cars. Maybe there could be a bit more on the driver as well. Yeah. So what did they say at McLaren when you asked them about that? Uh, they said, yeah. I think they just entertained me. <laughs> yeah, there's a weight equivalent to lap time. And yeah, we have watts per kilo as well. If you're talking about those fine margins, it'll make a difference. Mm. If you've got yeah, square wheels, it's not going to make too much of a difference, is it? And that's the other thing. Before you get to your marginal gains, you want to make sure you've got your big ticket items. And that's coming back to the um, to the data and the engine 
the engineering and that's what I was saying before with the work that we did with others is you, you come back to what are your first principles because if you get your first principles right then the rest will follow and that's a really good way to be able to prioritize your work and where your performance is going to come from. In racing or in, in track driving some of the first principles is the line you choose to drive you're in control yeah. of that when you brake and how you brake, uh, the gear you choose, how you get back on the throttle, how you steer, how aggressive or, or less aggressive you, you steer, and that, that's sort of dependent on the vehicle you're in. So what are the kind of first principle things in rowing that you have to get that bit right? Well, just reflecting on what you, you just said, those are all things that the driver does, doesn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So if you can find a coach that can help you get the right line, yeah, <laughs> do all those things, then you're going to learn quicker than doing a trial and error yourself. So that that just comes back to the to the value of getting some outside input. You're not on your own. Yeah, look, the first principles are what underpins the speed. We'll have things like stroke length, power, and stroke rate. And if you can manipulate those, then you'll manipulate the speed. You know, it gets a bit more technical and a bit more in-depth than that. But fundamentally, lots of coaches are really good on the stopwatches, but that yeah. doesn't really show. That's the, the whole thing. It doesn't really show the whole picture. And in our sport, bit like yours it's an outdoor sport we'll have a headwind and a tailwind and sidewind so the condition or temperature will change or it'll be raining or it won't be raining and that'll affect the time but if you can work those first principles and change the things that that underpin the speed then you're making progress yeah we have exactly the same challenges there with time and it's funny when i was started working with coaches i come to some of your training sessions and literally everyone's priding themselves on their stopwatch uh skill yeah Yeah. how, how accurate they can use that stopwatch and that's actually very similar to motorsports. Well, I was on the pit wall. My times were pretty much the same as the official times. And we're, I'm pretty good at the old stopwatch. But the interesting piece that you're talking about is actually, right, that's a measure which is relevant, of course. But if you're looking at a developmental thing, it's okay. It's more important. If you look at the driver, how much uh, of the capacity of the car did the driver extract in those conditions? And we have some metrics you can use for using accelerations. So you, you can't measure the grip of the car, but you can measure the effect of grip, which is its ability to accelerate laterally as well as longitudinally. Yeah. So what you do with your feet or what you do with, with your hands. So that's a kind of a nice thing. So you can say, no matter what the conditions, I would expect this kind of shape uh, of acceleration. So have you got something similar in rowing that you look at from that point of view? Yeah. So we'll look at the acceleration trace uh, yeah. because if you take it, if you take it back to get into the depth, into it, the sum of the forces creates the acceleration trace. The acceleration creates the velocity trace. And if you get your velocity trace, because we're, we've got an impulse in our, in our boat, so we've got a, a minimum and a maximum in the speed, it, it brings up the minimum speed, so your average velocity is faster. That's the process that we look at. And then you can look to see what does it look like if Paul and Samir row together as opposed to Samir and Frank rowing together. Yeah, if you can look at some of those traces and then of course, we've got pacing's important, and I presume that's in, important in motor racing as well. And that's something that needs to be developed because you you need to be able to have a, a feel to be working at 99.9% for the race, not 110% for the race. So you've got a you've got a gold medal speed that you need to do, but you've also got the gold medal distance you've got to go over. So a lot of the data and, and looking at how a person can keep their power their optimal power over sustain it over a period of time is important as well is that your job as a coach to do that well there's biomechanists and scientists with that stuff i've learned to use it myself so it can't be too complicated um <laughs> i like to get in there and have a look at the data because then i okay. can see if it's making the progress that i like so i, I see it as a, a coaching tool and a monitoring tool not just as a testing tool yeah and that's another nice uh, segue, really, between the two. It's a case of looking at the the information from a, a developmental point of view, rather than just a, like a statement of, "Well, that's as good as you are." It's, you know. Yeah. So that's. I think that's really important. I know when you're writing a training program, you have a test, but you, and you have to be prepared to test on that day and have a maximal output and really going to test your speed. But you can monitor your training and monitor your speed on the way through. You, you don't have to be doing maximal stuff all the time because if you break out of the maximal work, well, you've got to prepare for it and you break out of your training. It might be, it may or may not be different in motor racing, but if you can work on different parameters that build up to that test so that you can monitor your performance on the way through and then test periodically, then you get to 
to review that data and then come back and rework your plan and, and then away you go for that. So you raise a good point there. I'm not sure if there's an equivalent really. Depending on what level or type of racing you're doing, or, or, or even track driving, the idea often is just to be the equivalent of a maximal effort every time. So you're just trying to always just nibble away at your lap time and trying to make it better. And maybe that's not the right thing to do. Maybe there's something we could learn there about going, you know what, if we step this down to 95% so we can drive around quite easily, what could we uh, improve or learn or do better? Because the problem that we have at maximum effort all the time is mistakes yeah. so you're constantly on a limit of grip you, you trip over that limit and you're making mistakes and, and it can get messy and heroic and that's slower as well as so, so maybe maybe the quality of practice is not quite as good what you've described happens in rowing so actually you make you're great at technical gains at sub maximal work and then of course you need to apply it to maximal work but you're able to learn where you're not you know on edge the whole time and bit more relaxed to be able to get the right lines to be able to do all those things that you, you said you need to be able to deliver and then you could do intervals you can do it at you know one a little bit slower and then go fast and so that you're picking it up and and you're not constantly putting yourself under that pressure you need to be under that pressure but you need to prepare for it absolutely so i've got a question for you because it's they're both kit sports so is there a a situation where people get a little bit obsessed with setup is so, i mean i'm not 100 percent sure what setup means in mowing so maybe you could give us a guide on that is there a piece around like you're, you're focusing yeah, on the totally. wrong bit here guys i have a call it boat whispering like uh, horse whispering yeah look we like to think of ourselves as the noble sport and um, so that the racing is between the horses not the chariot so there's a rule that all equipment has to be affordable and available to everybody and the january before the olympic games there's nothing new can come in after that. And, and so they're trying to, you know, keep it between the, the athletes and make sure the sport doesn't get too expensive. That is one of the differences. But making sure that you've got the best equipment available on the market is important. But the setup of the athlete, because I guess it's like the gears. We work with levers and so you've got a, a pin that the, the all goes against. You've got your all length. You've got your inboard, your outboard, or different you know ends of the oar, uh, where the fulcrum is. And if you don't get that bit right, they'll finish rowing their race and they're not tired because they haven't had enough load. Or alternatively, they've got too much load and they die towards the end of the race. You know, and you need to be able to change that gearing for a headwind or a tailwind as well, so that you do that, so that you're able to get the pacing. So actually, the individuality, because not all of us are built symmetrically. We might have one leg longer than the other, or different arm lengths or someone's broken a collarbone so you can rig a lot out of that or alternatively you can have someone that's six foot seven rowing with someone who's six foot and they've got a time that the same length under the water so you can change the gearing for that to be fair you can do a lot of that and then you can as you said some sometimes when you see this with coaches primarily you want to be be tweaking with it all the time and often that's for the coach's anxiety rather than the rower's anxiety because the the rower just wants it to feel good and feel comfortable and feel fast so the coach ends up spending a lot of time with the screwdriver and change, changing things where sometimes they don't really need to be and to be fair sometimes the coach will tell the rower that something's changed when in fact he hasn't changed it at all and see what that feels like so i have to say that happens in racing <laughs> it's been racing as well all the time because it's a coach decision there so our equivalent of coach in a professional sense is probably that, that race engineer which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that type of role but they're very much engineers so they're you know some have more or less empathy for the driver and yeah quite often you know the driver's coming in and you know money about a lot of different things and then say they've changed something and then they haven't and then the driver comes in oh it's brilliant whatever you did was wonderful <laughs> Part of me like thinks that's okay, and then another part of me thinks it's not okay. <laughs> I don't know. There's a. Um, I I that's not something I do, uh, but it's something I've seen done. Exactly. I think the argument is that well, they went quicker, and my, and my argument is, but you've broken the trust. Yeah, correct. And and and, <laughs> and, and you know the if you do it, you need to explain that afterwards don't you because you like it's without the trust the the relationship's not there that's a fundamental yeah so you've got quite a few things you do set up on the boat but you've, the focus really is do you think you can do that is it about synchronizing who you have in the boat more than optimizing um, for an individual 
No, you need to optimise for an individual. And there's three contact points with the boat, the feet, the seat, and the and the oar. So you, you can manipulate to a greater or lesser extent all of those, as well as the gearing that I mentioned. Because I mentioned before, the sum of the forces underpins the acceleration trace, the velocity trace. By, by in, individualising the rigging, you get the timing of that force more together, yeah? So you can work on manipulating things to be able to get the timing better with the drive. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it does, it's surprising actually how many similarities there are. When we were talking about this show beforehand, you know, what should we talk about? It's like, actually, there's loads of similarities. It's just the vehicle's yeah. different. Yours is a lot faster. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully a bit quicker, yeah. So what, what what about sort of logistics and stuff like that? How do you, how do you get your staff around the world? Is that like... You can't just chop the boat up. And this is, it might sound like a bit of a weird one, but these are the practical problems that people listening will have. It's, it's all very well having this car on the track, trying to get the most of it, but the majority of the effort is getting to the track. <laughs> totally, and we face all that as well. If viewers are on the M4, you'll often see uh, boat trailers going back and forth, and, and actually the, the eights do get sectioned in half. Yeah, and they've done that so they can fit in a container. It's a 40-foot container. So most of the national teams will have two fleets. So there'll be a container that goes off to, to Tokyo from Europe and from the Americas, and and then they'll have to use other boats in training and other boats in racing. You know, I think that's something that we can do a lot better because we've got boat trailers and they go on, they bash down the, down the road and you've got $100,000 or well, more than hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of boats on the, on the trailer and we lose trailers as well. They roll and the boats get damaged and I've turned up to a world championships and uh, stupidly the guys put timber racking in the container and of course they dropped the container the last few feet so all the boats concentrated down on top of each other yeah we've got all those sort of problems and and i presume it's the same as you a lot, uh, often our events all the boats are in a paddock yeah. and um, then you're off to the you're off to the right to our race track and you're having to have the physio under a tree and the the warm up down behind the behind the toilets or whatever the case may be. And, and there's lots of diff- different environments that you have to perform in. You know, it's not all like the Olympics. Yeah, that's very relevant in the sense of the preparation beforehand. People say, you need to do a warm up and where and when am I going to do that? Because I've got this yeah. logistical challenge. I'm not at a gym. <laughs> I'm in a field. Exactly. So you, you have the same things. It's amazing how many similarities there are. Oh, fantastic. Well, have you got any final thoughts? Yeah, you might- I've asked this before and I thought Chris Ambrook, the psychologist, we had a look and we thought, what makes the difference between those that are real champions and then those that might have got the medals or got into the into the finalists? What would we see as attributes that sort of separate those people? And, and we came up that, you know, they always act with positive intent. So, you know, your, your intentions are always about making the boat go faster so you're not trying to undercut other people. There's always a passion for, for learning and being able to focus on the important things and forget about the, the irrelevant things. So that's part of quenching desire to, to make themselves better that, so they're really motivated to be the best version of, of them. And, and an interesting one is solving problems rather than describing issues. And I'm sure we've all been around that where we can talking about what the problems are and what we can't do but we need to come up to, you know, how do we solve them and what are the solutions going to be, solution-based. But another one is having difficult discussions when they need to be had. And this gets back to that relationship. We're not going fast enough. What about it? Like it's fine to paper over it, but actually that wasn't up to our standard or this is up to our standard. Or look, Samir, I know you like going down to the pub, but every time you come in the next day, you're, you're driving two seconds slower or whatever it is. And you see it in, in the Olympics so many teams and people undermine themselves before they get to the games and then they'll have the the really straight discussions after the olympics yeah it might come out in the debrief like afterwards i knew samir was going down the pub but i just chose not to say anything to him i wish i had have said something because then we would have got more consistency and we would have done this so that's where you know having the difficult discussions that need to be had the, the bit about trust and relationships and building that and having open communication and using actions to build confidence. And another one when we looked across was was actually they were quite good at exploiting different personality differences because okay. someone might be 
have a different personality, but they can still help you go fast. And in a rowing boat, yeah. you're only as fast as the slowest person anyway. And ideally, that's you, because then you're rowing with better people and you can be really good. And then the team's really fast. So being able to exploit those differences. And then what I said before, the quality of work is just so much higher all the time. And that makes a difference in the winning. Oh, that's loads. <laughs> that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. There's so much there. And, and to pull all those bits together... We've certainly got a lot of food for thought there. You brought up some stuff I wasn't expecting. I just want to think about that for a minute because that's a really interesting. And yeah, a lot, I really like that bit about disappointed but not upset. I think that's a real, that's a really good one, that. Because if you're feeling a bit disappointed or whatever, or that hasn't gone your, the results haven't gone your way, often people are saying, oh, don't worry about it. Exactly. You feel bad about being down and yeah, they're trying yeah. to cheer you up. But kind of what yeah, you're yeah. saying there is really quite subtle but powerful in the sense of like, it's okay, except yes, yes, it's good that you feel disappointed, but just don't take it too far. Don't be completely yeah. off the scale there. And I think that's a really yeah. good one there. Because in essence, you don't want people to try and make you feel better. You just want them to tell them how to go faster. Like. <laughs> yeah. And then because it's an amateur environment and not a professional environment, it, there's, there's other context to those conversations. Yeah. It might be parents or friends who are yeah. trying to do that. And then you've got to be, you want to be like the spoiled brat because you're like, well, hang on, you've still got out and they've had fun and no, don't get me wrong like parents and those significant others hugely important in being able to support you through all that stuff too yeah well look paul thank you so much Any for taking time? the time it's been a real honor yeah. to have you on the show and best of luck with the next yeah. step for yourselves and you know if you find yourself in a motor racing paddock anytime soon <laughs> yeah and look good luck everybody and don't be afraid to reach out to anyone because we're all in sport and we all do this and everybody likes sharing stories and journeys and good luck to everybody and may you go as fast as you wish One absolute honour to have Paul join us on the show. There are so many similarities between motorsports and rowing, yet his insights and perspectives are refreshingly different. I do wonder whether McLaren missed the trick when he came to visit, but I hope that you benefit significantly more. You may know that at the end of season one, I wrote the Motorsports Playbook, a summary distilling the first 20 shows into nuggets of wisdom. I made the notes so that you don't have to. If you've not got it yet, go and grab yourself a copy from the website. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and visit us at yourdatadriven.com.